Hello, people. Today, my guest is Dr. Stoller. He's a world-renowned anthropologist, and we'll be, discuss we'll be discussing a few of his research papers and his very unique and interesting take on how anthropology and the senses need to be more intertwined and be looked at a bit differently than the most other people would think, because in his words, or not in his words, but in the overall take, the Western world, they puts too much emphasis on the intellectual aspect and the visual component. I'm very curious about it. He's written a new book recently. That's also something we're going to talk about. Now, Dr. Stahl, please, if you would be so nice, would you tell the audience a bit about you and your research so that they have a general overview of you? Well, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I've been doing cultural anthropology for many, many decades. Um, My specializations are the anthropology of religion, uh, the anthropology of the senses, uh, as well as uh, urban anthropology. You know, I did, uh, I've done research in the Republic of Niger over a very long period of time in West Africa, but I've also done research in New York City among West African immigrants uh, there uh, and how they adapt to life uh, coming from rural villages to live in the you know, the, the, the big apple, so to speak. So, so uh, I've done that. And I've also focused an awful lot of my attention on the writing of ethnography. Um, and to that end, I offer uh, writing workshops where I, uh, we, uh, I sort of facilitate workshops on how to uh, articulate uh, sensuously uh, anthropological findings so that anthropological research reach, reaches uh, a larger audience. So I've been doing that for a, a long time, and uh, I teach at Westchester University in Pennsylvania, but I also am a permanent fellow uh, at the um, uh, Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences at Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen in Germany. A big resume, a lot of work that you've done, a lot of research. I got to admit, uh, prepared for this interview. I've got multiple pages of questions. Okay. I know that we won't be able to get through all of them. I know that it's just so yeah. exciting to have you here. Um, so. One of the interesting aspects that I really thought was pretty unique with you, except of the way you write, because the way you write in your books, in your papers, it's really interesting how you focus and describe it in a way that it's about the sensory experiences much more that you try or at least it seemed to me that way that you try to take the reader into the situations with all of the five senses to try to get it all into that instead of just intellectual aspect and just the just the words and just okay what did you see the smell the taste all of these different takes it's really interesting because especially with the with the um not the religious man, it's also religious, the religious yeah. themes, but like the rituals and such stuff. But I would like to stay on the more academic side at the okay. beginning of this interview. How did it come to you to even focus on that aspect, if I may ask? Well, what, what was it like to develop or to find, hey, I need to I, I care was, more about I was, I was trained in a traditional uh, way in social sciences. So I was trained to, you know, excise the senses and focus on vision and intellectual aspects. I was trained to um, collect data and then use that data to formulate theories that would uh, quote unquote explain uh, social life in a particular place. And then I was also trained to write in a certain way where you just, you write uh, like a scientific report. So it's it's called in, it's called plain style. It's where there's no exaggeration. They're just, you state the facts and uh, you postulate your theory, and uh, that's the sort of the the bane, as I would say it, of uh, of academic discourse. And I was trained. I mean, I, I was trained to do that. And when I went to do my dissertation research, I was wanted to you know focus on uh, uh, focus on a sort of a particular linguistic theory, uh, and um, so that's what I did. And during the time that I was in my in the in, during my field work. Um, I began to apprentice myself to a number of healers uh, as part of my research. And um, during one episode, uh, I went to accompany a healer to a man who was very, very sick. 
and I watched the healer, uh, you know, recite incantations over the man's uh, body. I mean, he was still alive, but he was very, very sick. Um, sprinkled perfume on him. And then he said, come with me. We're going to find this man's soul because he, he is, his condition is his soul has been stolen. So I said, oh, sure, right. You know, I didn't think that was quite possible. So, yeah, so, okay. So we go up, uh, we go up outside of the town of Mehana in, in, in Niger, uh, in the western part of Niger. And we go up and we see uh, uh, on the outskirts of town, there are a little uh, hills of uh, the husk of millet seeds, right? And it's called in Songhai Duo. And he said, okay, watch me, he said. So I, he, he sort of gets on his hands and knees and he goes into one of these these hills of, uh, you know, sort of mullet, mullet, uh, millet husks. And then he jumps up and he flops. He says, oh, 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 he said, ah, I freed the man's spirit. I freed the man's spirit. I said, I said, what? And he said, um, did you, and, and, and the spirit is going back to his body. I said, what? And he said, did you see it? And I said, I didn't see what? Did you hear it? Hear what? Did you smell it? Smell what? And then he looked at me and he said, you look, but you don't see. You listen, but you don't hear. You feel, but you, you, know, you touch, but you don't feel. And he said, it'll take you many years to develop the sens sensibility to perceive and, 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 and uh, apperceive these kinds of things. So that was like a, like a major moment for me. And I said, my God. You know, and then that sort of turned my turned my head around and convinced me that it was important to train one's senses and to be be aware, be be in the world, so to speak, fully, fully sensuously to understand uh, another group of people and, and how they how they live, what they believe, uh, their dramas, their loves, their losses, et cetera, et cetera. So that from that point forward, I dedicated myself to learning as much as I could about the senses uh, and using uh, as much sensuous description as I could uh, in my works that followed from that research. Wow, it's really interesting, really, really interesting background story. Wow. Reminds me a bit of books like Carlos Castaneda or something like that. Well, well it's, it's <laughs> Carlos Castaneda is problematic. So, but, uh, because his his book, his books tend to be yeah, uh, it's pretty well documented that his books are sort of fictitious. They're sort of made up. But this actually happened to me, and and then so that's that was part of my uh, apprenticeship, which spanned seventeen years with two different healers. Wow. Uh, part of that apprenticeship uh, was learning to you know tune my senses into the to the to the uh, vibrations and to the frequencies of the Songhai people, and okay. then attempt to to recreate that in my in my works. Now I gotta ask. I, I just gotta ask. Like, would you say you got more attuned? Was it where I say I learned to perceive the world in ways that I did not at the beginning? Absolutely, sure. Because you wow. I started paying attention much mm -hmm. more to the smells around me, right? And I paid more attention to the texture of the things, the texture of the surfaces. Um, I listened more. In, I, I tried to engage, and this is a difficult thing for people in the West in what's deep listening. So when you're listening to someone, you're not just listening to their words, you're listening to their whole being, their persona, how they're presenting their words. Um, you know, so, um, uh, and of course I attuned my vision uh, more, uh, I paid more attention to what was, you know, going on around me rather than just looking at, at something to see what data I could extract from it. I tried to, you know, sense the whole visual scene ar around me. And that led me to, you know, start reading, getting my inspiration for how how can I write about this kind of thing, and so um, I started reading, you know, uh, creative nonfiction writers and fiction writers to see how they evoke things like smell, taste, uh, sound, uh, texture, and, and the like. And so I started putting those kind those elements. And when I first started writing my works, started putting those elements uh, into my books. Really, really interesting how that came. Really interesting. Wow. I think that's awesome. I think most most anthropological discoveries come not from some, you know, from reading a book in a, in a, in a, in a library or um, 
a discussion. They come from the experience that anthropologists have uh, in the field. And uh, field work is a very intense experience. And um, a, a lot of insights come from, you know, our sort of implication uh, mm -hmm. in the field. Really interesting. And after that, like, special experience where you say, okay, that was a defining moment in your life. How did you step from that to the research? How did you say, okay, I'm going to research that, if I may ask. So where well, was the, how did you define it? Me, so, so, there, so there are lots of people who do research on the census, right? So, that, yeah, and that was, um, and I was interested in reading about that, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to use this, the, the dimension of the census, the sensorium, to uh, describe social life um, more fully and more vibrantly. So the the whole note for me, the census, what, you know, my focus on the census was a springboard to uh, a different way of writing uh, ethnography, what anthropologists do. We write ethnography. That's our gift to the world. And But uh, unfortunately, a lot of ethnography is written in that sort of, as you mentioned, in a kind of dry form, right? It's it's a, it's looking to focus on a theory, theoretical issue. Uh, there's a lot of jargon in it. Uh, it's scientific discourse. And I said, and, and to me that, you know, that was, uh, if I, I mean, I could, have, I mean, I've written uh, scholarly articles that have that sort of thing in it. But for my books, I wanted to, I wanted to bring the scene of life uh, in fully uh, to the to the to the page and hopefully to the reader's experience. So it was um, so it manifested itself in everything that I've produced, quite frankly. Um, and so and and one of the things that it forced me to do or compelled me to do was to um, you know invite write use a lot of narrative in my writing. And if so the world is complex, social life is complex. Um, and uh, the, the the reigning sort of paradigm in social science is reductive. So you know you take a complex scenario, you reduce it to some essential characters, uh, I'm sorry, essential theories or theorems, principles, and that those uh, supposedly will explain how social life works. Uh, for me, it was just the opposite. I would say, you know, uh, you cannot capture the complexity of social, you cannot reduce the complexity of social life to a theory or a set of principles or a set of concepts. Those are useful, but to capture the complexities and the the sort of the luxury, you know, the sort of sensuous uh, modalities of social life, you need to employ narrative. In the narrative, you can, within the narrative framework, you can capture concepts and theories uh, in the body of the narrative through uh, the evocation of the senses, uh, which uh, ultimately what that does is it compels the reader to turn the page, right? My writers, so you know, I always ask myself when I was in my, during my uh, graduate training, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I doing this research? Why am I writing this book? Why do these kinds of things? Uh, and I, I thought I, I, I told myself, well, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of wisdom that the, the people that I you know I, I'm talking with, uh, they have a lot of wisdom to convey, right? So how do you, do you convey that wisdom through sort of uh, you know uh, French structural theory, for example, or the structural or post structuralism, or do you convey it through um, the narrative, how how the people themselves convey their knowledge from generation to generation? How do they do it? They convey it through stories, right? That's how culture is conveyed from one generation to the next. That's how wisdom is passed down from one generation to the next. It's through stories that evoke uh, philosophical themes, right? And so all my work is sort of dedicated to that, uh, using the senses to do that and to uh, attract readers uh, to, you know, pick up my books and read them. And hopefully, you know, once they start, they continue to turn the page until they finish. And maybe if I'm lucky, uh, maybe they will think something they haven't thought before, or maybe they may even feel something. They might be moved uh, to feel something they haven't felt before. Or maybe they have a new insight that they hadn't considered before. And so, I mean, that's, you know, that's why I do, that's why I write the way I write. 
And that's why the senses are so, the senses are the sort of means to that end. I, I gotta tell you, when I read your stuff, it was like, it, it reminded me of something that happened to me. And now for the views, just, I want to share that little experience. Because it was like, in my life, personally, it was the horse. It's a bit of a weird example, but I learned intellectually horsepower, what is a horse, how fast they run, how big they are, how strong they are, how we use them for agriculture, and so on and so on. But I, I come from the city. I have not seen a horse in real life, like for no. a long, long, long time. And then I think I was 21 or 10, 22, and I had that animal in front of me for the first time. And it was big, and it was strong, and it was the first time that I saw it move, that I smelled it, that it was there in front of me. And the difference between the experience of that animal in front of me and all of that knowledge from the books and such, I had a bit of that when I read your books. I mm -hmm. got to admit that this, like I was saying, the papers that are about, okay, here's a topology, here's this culture does X, Y, Z, they have this ritual, they do this, 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 they have that, that, that. And with you, it was more like, okay, look at it. Here it is. It is as it is. And that was really, really interesting because you did that as well for the African stuff as also, which was a bit surprising to me, with the, I mean, it was also West African immigrants and migrants, but it was in the, as you say, in New York, which is a yeah. completely different world. It's right. like, may you tell the views a bit about your work? What was it like? I don't know how it started in Africa or we can jump directly to New York. How, how can, you found them and how you worked with them. It's really interesting. I can, I can do both. Um, well, my work in Africa began because, um, well, I date myself here, but... Um, It began uh, when um, I went into the United States Peace Corps as a volunteer to teach English as a foreign language. And I was sent, um, and since I had French, um, I, I, had, uh, I had taken French. Um, so the Peace Corps trained me in intensive French. So by the time I finished the Peace Corps, I was fluent in French. And I, I, was, and then I picked, uh, being the ro romantic that I am, I picked the, the most uh, traditional um you know, country there are a number of francophone countries i picked niger because uh, apparently not that many people spoke french there and i wanted to learn an african language so i went to niger for two years and i fell in love with it i learned to speak uh songhai and my french got my french got pretty good and my songhai got pretty good and then i uh, i loved it so much that when i returned to the united states i went to graduate school and i wanted to find a way to get back there so for and so i um, I studied linguistics for a while for a master's degree, and then I got I went to get my PhD in, in social anthropology. And then I that started a, a long period of uh, you know, started uh, my research there. And it spanned uh, almost a 20 year period uh, in, in Niger over, um, you know, not going uh, for, for a year at a time, sometimes three or four months, but over a long period of time. So I developed a lot of friendships. Um, developed a lot of uh, bonds of trust with the people there. I uh, learned an awful lot from my my, my teacher, Adamu Genitongo, uh, and uh, other people who taught me about plants and they taught me about uh, you know, sorcery, things of that nature, um, and uh, how, how people confront challenging uh, ecological conditions, which they have in Niger, because there, there are periodic famines, and, and so it's a tough place to live. But then, um, at one, after my te teacher passed away, um, I felt uh, I had an incident that happened. I, I fell ill while I was in Niger, and I was told that the reason that I fell ill was one of the rivals of my teacher uh, had sent something to me to make me sick. Um, I didn't know whether that was the case or not, but I was deathly ill, and I returned to the United States um, you know, and, you know, one, one of my healer friends said, well, you know, in this situation, you should, you should leave as soon as you can. This is not safe for you here. So I left, uh, and I got some local medicine, um, to treat my illness, which is, I, I was sort of paralyzed. And I, and I returned to the United States. I was in my bed for two months. I went to a tropical medicine specialist because I had some symptoms of malaria, 
but he did test on me and he said and he said well you didn't have malaria it was something else and so i i followed the prescriptions that this uh, uh herbalist told me to follow and it took me after about two months i got better i was able to get up and walk and and and, and uh, i was healed from it but that sort of you know freaked me out to say the least and uh there was some bad blood after my teacher died the rivalries jealousy and so i decided um um i wasn't going to go back uh that to to niger and so uh, a friend of mine said you know well why don't you go up why don't you, you know there are people from niger in 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 harlem in new york city why don't you go there and check it out? Maybe you could do something there. You know, I, I was thinking about doing it, but why don't you do it? I think it would be perfect for you. So I take a I take a bus up to, to, from my home in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, I took uh, I took a bus up to Harlem. Got off at 125th Street and uh, Lenox Avenue, which is the heart of Harlem, and I walk into an African market. I mean, it's just an African market there. And I see this guy in the corner, and I say, uh, I start to speak to him in French, and he says. Uh, I said, where are the Nigerian people? He says, just go down the sidewalk. Walk down the sidewalk. I see a guy. He looks at me and he starts to speak to me in Songhai. I speak to him back in Songhai. Next thing I know, there are a whole group of people speaking Songhai to me. And they said, you know, sit with us. You know, you know, we, you know let's talk. And that was the beginning of a very, very, I'm still doing that research, actually. So I used to go up to Harlem right under the, uh, one of the guys had a table under the Apollo Theater, the famous Apollo Theater. Um, and then uh, I would sit with them and uh, do all sorts of things. And that was the beginning of my research there. And uh, as I said, it's ongoing. Uh, very different set, different, different set of scenarios. Um, so here I was interested in the informal economy. I was interested in uh, the presentation of African things to African-Americans, uh, trademarks, um, uh, licensing, uh, you know, the sort of gray market, things being sold under the table. There's all sorts of, you know, all sorts of stuff going on there that was sort of, uh, and also the immigration policy of the United States and how these guys dealt with that. So my book, Money Has No Smell, is all about, uh, it's, it follows the, 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 the lives of three of these trailer, traders and implicates, you know, how, how do they deal with their alienation? How do they deal with being a West African from a rural area, living in Harlem of all places, you know, how do they deal with it? And how, and most of them dealt with it pretty successfully, quite frankly. Um, and so, um, you know, I mean, I, I remember one time going up there and, you know, I had a battered old car and uh, and they had seen it and they sort of laughed at my battered, battered old car that I drove up there. And and, and my one, one guy used to he say, well, come take a look at my car. I said, okay. And so we walk out and we say, he had a BMW, right? Uh, and uh, I said, well, I, it was new. I said, well, gee, how? He said, well, things are going pretty well here, you know? He said, come on over here. And he said, what do you think of my stock portfolio? I said, it's okay. Uh, so it's, you know, so they're, they're very kind of inspiring people. And um, they, they came with nothing and they took with very little, they would been able to uh, uh, make a go of it in New York City. Uh, and also support their families back in Niger, sending money, remittances back to to Niger. So uh, I was, uh, you know, inspired by them, and uh, so I spent a, a lot of time in New York, and I still do. I still go up, you know, um, I still go up to visit them, and I'm still doing research uh, among them. But uh, so that was those are my two major research uh, uh, Niger and uh, Niger. I've been back to once. But it's very difficult now to go to Niger because of the coup, and there's a lot of um, terrorism. Uh, Al Qaeda of the Maghreb is working in the town where I work. Uh, it's not safe for me to go. And then if, you, if uh, another town that I, I wanted to go to, I couldn't go to because of Boko Haram. So um, if I go to Niger, I, I, you know, so I stayed in the capital city. And if I wanted to return, I'd have to stay in the capital city. It's too too dangerous to. Uh, to you know, uh, I'd, I'd be very good kidnap material, so to speak. <laughs> oh shit! Sat, sat to you. Even though, even though I speak speak the, you know, an African language, uh, you know, mm -hmm. then they just say I'm a spy or something, you know. So you no, know, it's not. It's um, it's too dangerous. It's very sad, actually. What's happened mm -hmm. to Niger? Now, 
You talked about so many interesting points. Now, I'm not sure uh, I would just very quick, very, very quick. And for the views about the books that we talked about, like the uh, Money Has No Smell and the other book that we'll be talking about, it's all down in the description, the links that you can buy it directly, no problem. Just so you know, guys, okay? Look down in the description. I would like, because a lot of our viewers are not in the academia themselves. They're often entrepreneurs, business people, something like that. So can you just give me a short rundown on the methodology of the research? Like, how does it work? Do you as a professor just think, okay, I would like to know what it smells like there, or what it tastes like there. Okay, oh. the university gives me oh. money I go there and like, what is it like? Oh, to, to, get, to do the research, you have to write a research proposal. Just like you do a business proposal if you want to attract investors, right? So you write a research proposal and you demonstrate how this how this is going to how this particular subject. So I a first proposal was about spirit possession and local politics, and you know, and, and they would contribute to uh, uh, the the anthropological literature on spirit possession and how this worldwide phenomenon works and how how, how it's differentiated from. How, you know, how it works in one particular place in Niger, how it's differentiated from how it works in other parts of Africa, how it works it's in, it's in you know, South America, it's in Asia. Um, you know, and for the money has no smell, it was all about, um, uh, the, the proposal was about finding out more about how immigrants adapt to uh, social life in the United States and how it might have an impact on immigration policy of the government, right? So that's, you know, so you have to, you know, in order to get funding, you need to focus on some of those kinds of issues. But you know, always when you do a proposal, the proposal is sort of like a distant kind of thing, and it's important to do it and do it well. But when you get onto the field and you and you start experiencing things, uh, you know, things change. So, you know, my initial project in in Niger was to look at uh, sort of the uh, politics of uh, uh, the politics of spirit possession vis-a-vis -vis Islam. So there's they had sort of sort of traditional Islam and then you have spirit possession and they sort of coexist but not very easily. And mm -hmm. I was going to focus on that on the local level. And then you know there is a there's a uh, strange mix you could say because in Islam it's very forbidden about talking to entities magic and so on that's very very forbidden but at the same time in Africa there's a strong culture of shamanism and and sorcery and such and and, and, and spirit possession also but they yeah. have a they have a blend of that so it's that's really a blend. Interesting. That's yeah it's a blend so um so you know a number of things happened um, and this is in one of my books, but so I was busy doing that, and um, I was sitting in my. I had this, you know, mud brick house I lived in, and I had a old Smith Corona typewriter, manual typewriter. I was typing my. I typed my field notes, and people from the village would come and look, watch me type. Is this strange white man sitting in the middle in, in his little hut, typing? And you know, letters. You know, letters are, are going on the page, and they just thought this was a, a kind of very strange activity, right? Very strange. So, um, so you know, one day while I was doing that, uh, and I had these, uh, uh, I had a dirt floor and I had an old bed um, uh, and just one room, right? And I had a like a my roof was made of sticks and mud, uh, and um, in the rafters of the room there were these birds that made a nest, and the birds would poop all over my floor. So I get all very angry with them, and I knock their nest down. They fly away. Then they come back and build the nest. And each time they built the nest, it got a nest. It got closer and closer to my desk where I was tight. One day, while I was tight, and I said, after a while, I gave up. I said, forget about it. You know, I'm just not going to worry about it. So one day, uh, while I was typing, and and there was an audience of people there, uh, one of the birds pooped on my head. So I lost it. I got very angry. And I said, this is, I just can't stand this place anymore. I have to leave. And then one guy came up to me and he said, I have seen something today. I said, well, you know, I said, well, I said, no kidding. You know, the bird pooped on my head. No, no, no. You've been pointed out. I am a Sorco, a kind of healer, right? This bird is a special bird. And you've been pointed out. Come to my house tonight. We will begin to learn. So, so, so that's how I began my apprenticeship to healers, right? As a, not that I sought it out 
I, really? I, I did not see it, seek it wow. out. Interesting. Now, that, there, they saw it. That's when they said, we need to teach you because we've seen this sign, right? And the birds were apparently a manifestation of some spirit. And they taught me, and then they introduced me to my teacher, Adam Ujani Tongo. So I did not seek any of this out. Um, and um, so I could have said, well, I'm sorry, I can't do that because I've got my project here, right? So, so you never know what's going to happen. And in uh, in New York City, the same kind of thing is, uh, you know, I, I got introduced. I was interested in one market, the the Malcolm Shabazz Harlem market, Harlem market. And one day, a guy came up to me and he said, "What are you wasting your time here for?" I said, "What do you mean?" I said, "This is interesting, but come with me. I'll show you something more interesting." And he took me to this fantastic um, warehouse of African art in New York City, seven stories filled with African art in Africa, you know, hidden away. And he said, this is this is more interesting, don't you think? I said, it's pretty damn interesting. And so, um, you know, I uh, that sort of fleshed out my whole project on Money Has No Smell. So it's, I never expected that that wasn't in my proposal. That didn't have much to do with what I was interested in, but there it was. And so I just sort of followed my instinct and, um, you know, uh, that made my study that much better. It's really cool. It's really cool to hear. Really, really interesting. Now, God, there's so many questions. It's always hard for me to pick one because so so many interesting points. I would like to ask a bit about that sorcery and religious aspect and the senses. Like, how important is it? How much are these topics interconnected? And I would like to to tie it together with the question a bit uh, because you said well you needed to learn it you needed to learn it even back because we here in the west seem to have lost that ability as you said seeing without seeing hearing without hearing so what would you say are the differences from or let me rephrase that would you say the religious experiences in the west like the church are similar to the sorcery or religious experiences from these cultures, or is there a significant difference in how the senses are incorporated and how well, the spirit the, works with them? Well, the senses are you, you know, in 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 the you know, church, the sense I mean, church is going to church is a sensory experience. Now, I mean, with uh, the Catholic Church, at least, you know, with the with the sort of incense and uh, the visual splendor of it all, the sounds of you know, plain song and, and that sort of thing. So, um, but the for Songhai people, religion is seen as um, a series of paths, right? So it's it's a, like the path through life, and so um, you you know, uh, and you follow the path, and you learn as you walk along the path, and you you always learn from an elder, right? So one of the one of the key differences, um, uh, I would say, is that in West Africa, the wisdom of elders is seen as very very important and they are they are the you know the they are the um you know they are the arbit they're the ones who convey the wisdom the 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 practice etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know they are the the uh, the word that escapes me right now but they are you know they're the ones that they're the bastions of uh, of knowledge and practice and um and we don't get to that so much i mean i guess in the in the church you have some of that to some extent but um to me it's uh, to me the i mean it's a very interesting question to me it's um the the religion of and religion is, is a term that the practices that people have and, and the challenges they face in everyday life um you know, they they seem to be for West Africans more experiential. There's they they make up more of everyday life than, you know, here we separate uh, our everyday life, our business, et cetera, et cetera, and then people go to a, a church service or they go to the mosque or they go to the synagogue, uh, and so the religious experience is kind of separated from their everyday experience. Whereas uh, in other cultures, um, religion is more intertwined with everyday experience. So, you know, it, and that's, you know, one of the points that I'm, one of the points that I make, uh, I try to make 
uh, in my new book, uh, Wisdom from the Edge, is um, is that uh, you know ultimately all of this wisdom, all of this religion, real practice, sort of, it's all to make us. Uh, it's all an attempt to make us feel more comfortable in our skin. How do you feel comfortable in your skin? And that's it. You know, it's difficult to feel comfortable in your skin in in contemporary society. So many distractions, so much stress, so much uh, speed. And so another aspect of that is that uh, the West African practice is uh, you should slow down. It takes a long time to learn about things. You know, my apprenticeship to my teacher was you know, spanned 20 years, and I just sort of scratched the surface of his knowledge, you know, and um, expressed a fraction of that in my books. So, um, so slow down. Um, appreciate, you know, appreciate the sensuousness of the world, the wonder of the world. Um, learn how to treat one another with respect. Uh, learn how to treat nature with respect. Uh, and if we learn these things, then the life becomes viable. Uh, it becomes viable. If we don't, if we don't treat one another with respect, and if we don't treat Nature with respect. Uh, the song I say, you know, Genji Genimwa, uh, which means if you consume the bush, the bush will consume you. Or if you consume nature indiscriminately, ultimately nature will consume you. You have to treat it with respect. You have to treat it with, yeah, you know, with so that there's harmony, harmony between the village and the bush, or between you know social life and uh, social life and nature. If you don't do that, then, um, you know, nature will, you know, overcome the bush, you know, but the bush will overcome you or nature will, will sort of, you know, overcome society. And we see all sorts of evidence of that uh, in the world today you know, with uh, climate change, you know, we extract from nature without really respecting it. And uh, what happens, you know, we have, you know, hurricanes, super storms, floods, uh, uh, droughts, flood, and it's just terrible, right? And, um, and you know, my, my West African teachers, uh, they were aware of this, you know, for hundreds of years. Uh, and they, they were telling me this a couple, you know, 20, 20 30 years ago, uh, that we need to, you know, we need to listen to what they have to say uh, for the future of our species, quite frankly. And uh, yeah, that's the point of my book, Wisdom from the Edge. We, just, we need we need to listen, not just West African elders, but there are all sorts of other indigenous people who have elders who speak some, somewhat similarly about these kinds of issues. Yeah, and the uh, future is at what is what is at stake. Really strong words. Really strong message. Wow, wow. Can okay, just just I remember like. Just a little scratch on the surface of what you're talking about was for me when I went back to where my family comes from, mm. like in the Balkan, and experienced farming for the first time in my life. I was like 14 years old. It was and it was such a such a strong experience for me personally. Like this, the food is growing out of the ground and one bad hailstorm and you lose a lot. And yeah. and it was like I talked to the people who were like 70, 80, 90, 90 years old, worked every day of their life, you know, an 80 year old guy who had a strong arm I was like shot because he's a farmer. He's been working every day. And no matter how much you work, no matter how much you do, I remember because they were pretty religious, all of them. Yeah. And they told me, it's like, no matter what we do, we can't make the stuff grow. We can just work and take care of it. But right. we're not the ones who take who make the storm. We're not the ones who make the sun. We're not the ones who who make it grow. We can just put the seed in, but we're not the ones who make the seed sprout. So it was a really interesting take for me with the connection with nature and how how far apart a lot of people I was it I was too. Like oh, it's in the supermarket. You know, it's in the supermarket. Right. When you eat, right. it's in the supermarket, and the whole idea that it grows, that it that is connected with a lot of things, is completely lost for many, many people. Oh, millions of people. Yeah, a really interesting thing. That's a little bit uh, where 
and to plant it. I know you already talked a bit about it, but like, I don't want to call it the criticism of Western rationality, but a bit of it is like in there. So what would you say if someone is interested in it? Like we can't all go for 20 years to Africa, you know what it's like. Um, for the viewers, what are, what do you think are good little first steps towards being more conscious of these things? What could someone do who's interested in this, in these kind of things? In your well, uh, well, I think one of the things is to um, be aware of the, the pace that you're living. So if you, you slow down, I mean, we all, it's very difficult to do that, but to slow down and appreciate what's around you. So like, for example, Uh, when I was uh, I was in Germany from April to June uh, in uh, in Bavaria, and um, you know I didn't have a car for the first time, which is nice. So I had to walk everywhere, and the town was you could walk any go anywhere in, in 20, 30 minutes. And there are lots of bicycle more bicycles than cars there actually, but also I had to go to my office. I had to walk um, along a stream um, for about two miles. And it was every morning I would walk that stream, you know, go walk by the stream. And I just, you know, I appreciate, I love to listen to the, the, the water running. And then I see people, you know, and, uh, you know, see the changes of the, you know, the, the, the leaves growing on the trees more, uh, the smell of flowers, um, all of that. I just appreciated that. And um, it made me slow down, right? Maybe slow down a little bit. Um, so uh, it's sort of like writing a book. You can't write a. It takes a long time to write a book, and if you rush through it, a lot of you know. If you rush through it, you can tell a book a book that's been sort of put together quickly. You know, too quickly, it doesn't hang together. It, so it's sort of like anything in any kind of uh, sort of the the notion of apprenticeship. An apprentice has to, you know, in in West Africa, apprentice it usually apprentices for thirty, forty years until uh, her or his master dies, usually a father or mother. And then they take on the rent, they take on the practice of the person. And, it, and they put through many tests, but it takes a long time. And the Songhai believe, this is very important. They believe that the young mind should learn nuts and bolts, basic kinds of things. And uh, which is, you know, which is important. Uh, and you could say, you know, you could look, you could learn, you know, some mathematics and you do uh, Fundamental fundamentals of chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. But they say that the mind, the the mind is, uh, swells with experience, right? So the more experience you have, the more the more the knowledge makes sense. And then, and so uh, it takes many many years. And the more and so the more experience you have with you know love and loss and all all the other things that accompany uh, anyone's life. And then. Um, By the time you reach the age of 60, which is sort of the, the you're, you're kind of an elder at that point, then at that point, your mind is ready to receive important knowledge. Up to that point, you're not ready to receive the great secrets, the great, the great things that are important. So when you become 60, then the elders will sit down and say, okay, now you know you've learned a lot, but you have now it really begins, right? And so ultimately the greatest, so you learn, you, you learn the nuts and bolts, and then you You begin to practice what you've learned, but your greatest responsibility when you become an elder is to pass that knowledge on to the next generation. That's the most important thing. And so it's a it's a slow approach, right? So there, you know, there are um, there are a couple of books about this kind of notion of slowness, so there's like the slow move, the slow food movement, right? So you appreciate, you know, rather than fast food and stuff like that, you appreciate a, a meal that's takes a long time to put together, tastes better. Uh, then there's a, there's, a, there's a book called The Slow Professor, where it's about literature and how, it, you know, we in, in the, the academy, we are sort of compelled to write grants, publish lots of papers, you know, that, you know sort of, um, not, you know, qu quantity over quality, and mass production, right? And they say, you know, what's, uh, so much is lost uh, in that process, right? So there's a favorite favorite aphorism from um, from uh, 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 Nietzsche, and he says, uh, "Is it Nietzsche? No, it's not Nietzsche. It's um, 
what's his name? It'll come to me. But it, um, the aphorism is, we see the straight highway before us, but we can't take it because it's permanently closed. So, you know, the straight highway is the sort of mass production, you know, they're going down the straight highway is fast. And, and you you lose, you see, you lose so much from taking that fast way from point A to point B. If you take the side road, right? If you that's Wittgenstein who said that. So you take the side road, um, you find you you discover all sorts of things that you would never see on the straight highway. So sort of taking one's time, taking the side road, um, you know, being res being respectful of people, even if they don't, you know, you never know who you're talking to, right? So in one case, I'll just tell a brief story. My teacher told me uh, there was uh, an old man uh, in a river market. Uh, and in Niger, there are people called Do, and the Do are the sort of uh, masters of a certain part of the river, so they control the the, the Niger River. But this old man had he had he was selling wood at the market, and you weren't really supposed to be selling wood. He cut down some trees. The government's trying to pres preserve the uh, sort of uh, preserve the, you know, the trees as much as possible because you have the desert is you know encroaching on 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 Niger. So he's selling this wood at the market, and uh, there's a guy who comes in a canoe. Uh, he's a big, tall guy. Uh, he was uh, sort of like a, a ranger, right? So he was a, a government official that officiates uh, an environmental officer, let's say, let's call him that. So he goes up to this guy, and, he's, and he's, he berates the old man, not knowing that he was a doe and had this special relationship with the river. He slaps him in the face, confiscates his wood, and uh, humiliates this old man, lack of respect, right? And so he didn't know who he was talking to. So he he wants to go back to the other side of the river where he left his truck. And so he um, he tries to hire some canoeists to take him across, and no one wants to go because they had, they were afraid because he they humiliated this old man. They knew who he was, and and the old man says, "Don't worry about it. You'll be okay." So the, the 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 soldier goes out into the middle of the river, and there's, uh, suddenly there's a whirlpool. The soldier is thrown from the boat and drowns in the river, and the canoeists come back. So my teacher says, treat everyone respect. You never know who you're talking to. You should respect people as much as you can, because maybe they know something or they have something that you don't know about, and it could come back to bite you. Wow. Strong story. Wow. Okay. Always, yeah. You never know. You never know. Always be respectful. His thing is to try to treat everyone with as much respect as possible. Right? And that's it. You know, and he says if you do that, there's harmony. You know, there's harmony in the village, there's harmony. Uh, it's a better, better policy. So I've tried to do that as much as I can. Um, you know, and I try to slow down as much as I can. It's difficult. <laughs> living in the United States to slow down, but I try, I try as best I can. And um, so those are things that people can do. The other thing is to try to listen to people deeply. Uh, yeah, that was something that I wanted to ask. To yeah. listen deeply to another person. Explain that a bit more to me. Well, there is there is an article by a woman named Rose. She's a South African anthropologist named Rose Boswell. She knows more about, about it than I do. But basically what she's saying is you listen to someone, not just listen to their voice, but you you um, you listen to you listen to them sensuously. So you listen to, you know, you pay attention to their gestures, the 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 the, the tempo, the tone, the pitch of their voice. Uh, you pay attention to their being. What are they? What are they trying to express as a as a person? Not just the words that are coming out of their mouth. That's deep listening. It's a simple process. It's a simple prospect, but it's not so simple. It takes it's practice. Many many things that seem simple at first glance are really. I mean, it's like in the martial arts where you talk to someone who's been exercising for 50 years and then they say, oh, I can't even walk correctly. Even taking a step is, I, I do it wrong. 
And you're like, what do you mean with you doing it wrong? And he says, oh, you don't know how, how much you can learn in these simple things. It's really, really interesting take. That's why, that's why I wanted to talk to you. It was such, I could, I could keep on talking with you. It's, it's so interesting. Um, let me, but let me finish because I know we don't have uh, time forever. I would like to go back to more academia topics. Like, okay. where do you see the field of anthropology develop in in regards to sensual research and delivery of experience and wisdom in that field? Okay, that's a big question. So, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 I was there were about three or four of us who sort of were the first people to talk about the anthropology of the senses and me and there's another guy named David House who's very has written a book called the sensory Man the, the, the sensory manifesto which is a brilliant book uh some other people as well Steve Feld uh, who's one of the first people to write a sensuous ethnography uh back in the, like the early 1980s um and from that there developed uh mostly through the through the work of David House there developed um a uh, a whole movement called sensorial anthropology and there's a uh there's a journal called senses and society so there's been there's a lot more interest uh um, you know multidisciplinary interest in focusing on the senses and what it means for society so that's developed a lot um yeah i've spent much of my career trying to convince uh people to write more evocatively uh use more narrative in their uh, ethnographic writing so that one of the problems with anthropology in the uh, American Anthropological Association says, you know, they want to have a, a better pro public profile, right? And so they have uh, projects. There's a, there's a thing called the op-ed project, which uh, which of which I'm a part, uh, where we we uh, help uh, young anthropologists learn how to write anthropology for the public, right? So that the public can understand it. So we do that. Uh, so there's the, there's an emphasis on that, uh, and um, so I think that as time, so I've, it's been pleasing to see the sort of uh, development of the field along some of these lines, not all of these lines, but some of these lines. Um, and right now, there's a big push. You know, in anthropology, there there is an increasing number of uh, professionals, anthropologists who are you know, from they're not from the United States. I mean, they're from the they're from the South, right? So they're 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 they 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 come from populations that have not been, you know, fully represented uh, in academic discourse and in you know in pre previous generations. And so one of the things that they're focusing on is called decolonizing anthropology, so that you know they uh, and uh, focusing on. Uh, how anthropological theories have been sort of disembodied, they, you know, and sort of treat the people and their and their their information as data that, to, that you put into a machine that produces theory that explains things, right? And they say that um, that's sort of um, that's sort of the legacy of colonialism, and so. So there's a big movement now in anthropology uh, It started in the 1990s, but it's really come full full force with the sort of changing demographics of anthropological professionals. So that, uh, which I think is a good thing. And so uh, we have a lot of, a lot of uh, like the, the, the meetings of the Anthropology Association will be in November in Toronto. There are a lot of sessions on decolonizing anthropology and there's some books on that, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, uh, I see, you know, my role as, uh, you know, continue to write, but I, I want to mentor as many people as possible. And so uh, what I do is uh, I offer a lot of these writing workshops, many of them in Europe, um, do one in Göttingen in, um, in uh, the end of October, um, just to introduce people to techniques about how to express feeling how to express uh, sensuous experience uh, in prose. And so we have are like- workshops, Are these yeah. workshops just for anthropologists or would you say normal writers could benefit? Uh, so mostly, mostly anthropologists, but I have had 
I've had, you know, uh, there are so mostly anthropologists, but um, okay. you know, other people do other week workshops for, you know, uh, people who are okay. not anthropologists. But I've had other people who are not anthropologists take these workshops as well. Okay. So it's a great, you know, it's uh, it's an interesting experience because many of the people who take it say, well, they find it liberating because they um, it's for the first time they were they were you know, given techniques to express some of the things they may have felt and felt they couldn't express or didn't know how to express or weren't allowed to express. So, so that those are important developments in the field, I think. Mm -hmm. And what can we expect in the future from you? You're still researching. You're still active. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. Don't uh, want my, to... I have a new project. I. I, I I have a new project. Uh, yes, uh, tell us. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's about the it's about the nature of healing. Uh, so, um, who becomes a healer? Why do huh? they become a healer? Huh? And once they become a healer, and through their experience, and they, these may be physicians or they may be, maybe none, uh, you know, other kinds of practi practitioners. Uh, why you know um, why do they you know what what wisdom can they convey to a future generation so it's just i'm just beginning to do it i've just started doing some interviews with some people and um and, and i'm going to focus on healing as a kind of philosophical concept and i'll weave in the stories of various healers um to prove my point also now, now you get me curious i just want to ask one more thing i'm sorry this i yeah keep on ask but you learned a lot about healers and you interacted with healers from these alternative sources let's call it alternative sources i'm a bit curious i also de dealt with such people in my life i know like the scene a bit da -da -da, from different cultures from different religions and so on i would like to ask you about your opinion like where do you see the like the biggest difference from what you experience just purely subjective between this kind of approach of healing and the usual, how should I say, Western school medicine approach. So there's institutional healing, right? So there's institutional care, um, uh, institutional healing, which has, you know, it, which is, is can be wonderful. I mean, it's 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 a marvel, right? But the you know, so so um, the institutional healing is uh, is very good and uh, very very effective. But very often it leaves the person um, it leaves the person out of it, you know. And so the person becomes, uh, you know, someone who's waiting in a waiting room, or they, you know, or or you talk to your physician, and they, you know, most physicians have like 15 minutes to see you, and they have their computer out, so they're not even necessarily looking at you. So the institutional uh, orientation it tends to be a bit depersonalized, whereas um the the non-traditional i mean i'm sorry the the um the, the what i learned was very personal oriented it's much more personally oriented um and the person you the healers i know focus on the person as a whole being uh, so um it's uh, it's 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 uh, a bit different so one of the one of the papers i'm writing right now is about west african immigrants in new york city and their medical decision making and how you know, some of them, they all used Western medicine, institutional medicine, but they get frustrated with it with all the papers and forms to fill out and uh, and people not understanding uh, them or not understanding their, their sort of emotional state. Um, and so many of them did elect to stop treatment and return to Africa where they okay. seek out. Interesting. Interesting. Going to, very interesting, I hope. I will be on the lookout and will be surely to read that paper too when it comes out. That's gonna yeah. be quite a while for sure, I assume. Oh no, that paper that paper will probably be out next year sometime. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's awesome, awesome. Dr. Stoller, with that, we're sadly at the end of this interview. I could go on for many hours. I thank you very much for the time you thank took. You. I hope the audience learned a lot from you. Uh, we'll be linking all the books and all the different papers that we discussed down in the description below for you guys. Dr. Stoller, once more, thank you very much for taking the time. It was a pleasure and an honor for me. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much.
a pleasure uh, to to meet with talk with you, Faisala, and uh, wish you much success in your podcast and 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 uh, YouTube video channel.